Could, we, could you start off by saying your name, birth date, and where we are right now? Yeah, uh, I'm J.T. Scruggs. We're at the Destination Cleveland County office, and my birthday is 12-24-41 is when I was born. Start off with the history form. So it's Scruggs. You just want to put JT down? Yeah, that'll be fine. That's what everybody knows me about. Okay. Is the T your male name? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, I know it said 41, but what was the uh, date again? It's 12 24 1941. Oh, Christmas Eve. Mom and my aunt died two days before that. Never get them right. I'm getting, I get in trouble for three that. Of our, three of our four is in December. Oh, really? Third, tenth, and twenty fourth. Oh, wow. Me and my well, me and my two older brothers are in the same week in July. Uh, were you born in Shelby? Uh, I was born in Cleveland County. Yeah, uh, yeah. not necessarily in Shelby. Proper. It was in the county. It was in the county, Cleveland County. I think I was born at home. You're not sure of this? I'm pretty sure I won't. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you have a spouse? Mm-hmm. And what's her name? Joe, J-O, capital N-E-I-L. Same? Same, mm-hmm. N-I- Me. N-E-I-L. Joe Neal. Her, mm-hmm. I just thought she was going to be a boy. Joe Neal uh, B. B? B is for her. And Scruggs? Mm-hmm. Yep. And you have children? Mm-hmm. Two boys. Okay. Uh, oldest boy is named Chris, C-H-R-I-S. And Scruggs, and what year was he born? Oh, God, you're going to push me now. 62. And? Craig. And he was born in 62. Seven, I think. That's close. Well, he probably won't check in on whether you knew his year or not. Um, and did you go to high school in Cleveland County? Born in Springs. Born in Springs High School. Born in Springs. And what year? 1960. Did you do other education after that? Long time after that, I went to college. Okay. Uh, limestone. All one word. Mm-hmm. And it's in Gaffney, South Carolina. Okay. Limestone College. Gaffney, South Carolina. And what year? Nineteen seventy. Oh no, I graduated in nineteen eighty-one. Excuse me. Okay. I started back in nineteen seventy-five. All right, and um, occupational history, like what jobs you've done? Well, I worked uh, for the, I guess you could just say my whole career. I've I done some work while I was in school, at, uh, while I was in high school at a uh, place in Gaffney, but I uh, spent just under 44 years with PPG Industries. PPG Industries. Industrious? Mm-hmm. Industrious, right. Oh, D U S D R E S. And did you have a, probably had a lot of titles. But yeah, I had a lot of titles. Did you have maybe your last one? The last one, when I retired, I was plant manager. Plant manager. And I was plant manager for the last, gosh, number of years anyway. Mm-hmm. All right. So we'll do the agreement at the end. Okay. So I often uh, start interviews like this with um, I often start interviews like this asking people to tell me about their grandparents. So maybe you could start on your father's side or your mother's side, whichever one you. Prefer. Well, I start on uh, I start on father's side first, but I can tell you that I never knew either one of my grandfathers. But I knew both of my grandmothers. Uh, my grandmother Scruggs, uh, 
she died when I was in the eighth grade in high school. But I remember, what I remember most about her, she lived in Shelby the last, last number of years of her life when her and Earl moved over there. And uh, we didn't have much transportation back when I was a kid. What I'd done generally was walk anywhere I went and, or riding a bicycle. And, uh, but I can remember, we lived out in the country, below Boiling Springs, in a place called Number One Township. It was right on the South Carolina state line. It's on called the farm. Num Number One? Number One. There was, in Cleveland County, there was two townships that went by a number, Number One and Number Three. The rest of them were like Lattimore, Mosbury, or whatever. Yeah. But uh, it's two townships that went by a number. Uh, and so I can remember my dad, since I can remember, my dad worked for Duke Power up at Cliffside Steam Plant. And what I remember about my grandmother, most I remember about my grandmother Scruggs was, uh, when dad was off, he rotated. When he was off on his long break, a lot of times when I was little, we would, we would get to Boiling Springs and then run, they'd run a bus from Boiling Springs to Shelby about three times a day or four times a day or something. Yeah. Dad and I would catch the bus and come spend the weekend with Granny Scruggs. And she lived on in the mill village with Lily Mill, mm -hmm. where Earl worked prior to going to, into music. Uh, she was a fantastic cook. I remember that about her. Both my grandmothers were great cooks, but... Uh, and is that side of the family, I've heard a little bit about it, but I want to hear from you too, from... Um, uh, may I do give them scrubs. Mm -hmm. But um, is that side of the family from Cleveland County uh, way back? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Granny Scruggs was a root prior to marrying my grandfather. And I don't know for a fact, but it's possible she might have been out of the edge of South Carolina. I know part of her family was down there, but I, I, I can't say for sure whether, whether she grew up as a child in Cleveland County or not. My grandfather was from Cleveland County. Uh, his name was George Elam. And uh, the house that he and my grandmother lived in when he died and where the kids was born, where the f five kids of my grandfather was born, uh, is still standing. Oh, so wow. it's, it's, in fact, it's, well, there's not anybody in it right now. They're trying to sell it, but, and it's been changed somewhat and enlarged. It was a relatively small house before they added on to it. Uh, my grandfather passed away and, and I, I've never known exactly the deal, but my great grandfather was still living at that time when he died. Mm -hmm. And well, my grandfather, they built this house for my grandfather and grandmother to live in. Somehow or another, it never got deeded to them. And so when grandfather died, for whatever the reason, and I, I can't tell you why, for whatever the reason, my grandmother and the kids moved out and went to, to near Cliffside, North Carolina, which is about 15 miles, maybe. Not, maybe not even that far. And they lived out on a farm in Cliffside, out of, just outside of Cliffside, North Carolina. And then when my great-grandfather passed away, uh, they moved, they split all the property up then that he owned. He owned quite a bit of property. And my grandmother got property down near Broad River. And they moved back to a house down near Broad River mm -hmm. on a small farm and, uh, and farmed there until... Uh, everybody else was gone except Earl and, and Granny Scruggs. And they, he went to work over to Lily Mill then. He came out of the farm, out of, off the farm, and went to work at the Lily Mill, as he tells it, for 40 cents an hour. And uh, they lived, I think, for just a short period of time in Boiling Springs. And then he bought a home in the mill village at Lily Mill, and they moved to Shelby. Oh. So that's how they got to Shelby while he was working in the living mill. Prior to that, they had never lived in Shelby. Oh, okay. Your father, I, is it Junior? My father's Junior. Okay. Now, 
Dad was not still with them when they went to Cliffside. He'd already got married. Dad was a good bit older than everybody else. Mm -hmm. He was the oldest. And uh, I think I'm right that when they went to Cliffside, I think I'm right that he was already married. He, it's possible he wasn't, but I'm pretty sure he is already married when they went to Cliffside. And they lived in, outside of Cliffside about two years before my great grandfather died, and they came back here. And you, and sorry, I lost track a little bit, but your your father lived, where did he live? In number one township. Oh, number one township. So he stayed there. Well, he moved there. He okay. married, when he married my mother, my, on my mother's side, well, I was going to tell you one other thing about my grandmother. When grandfather died, excuse me, sometime after that, she remarried okay. and had another child. So there's, there's, there's five children three boys and two girls by my grandfather and then by her second marriage she had another daughter so they they have a half sister okay. that fills a hole for me actually. okay that i was i've been trying to figure out before, yeah but. right mm -hmm. uh she married a jolly the second time okay and in fact he was a brother to the oldest girl's husband Eula May and Ruby, and then there was Dad, it was Junie, and Horace, and then Earl. And then the half-sister's name was Vinnie May. Okay. Okay. And she still lives here in Shelby. Okay. Wow. And where, where do you have a, any of the earliest memories of your grandmother um, growing up or... My no. grandmother on the Scruggs side. Yeah, the one that you visited on. Yeah, Christmas that's stuff. pretty much my early memories of her because what I remember about the, from the time I could remember Granny Scruggs as they'd already moved to Shelby. Okay. And I didn't get to see her an awful lot. Just mm -hmm. when just when we could go over there on the weekends. Now, uh, just before she died, like I said, she died when I was in eighth grade. Just before she died, uh, the youngest girl, Ruby, was living in Boiling Springs, just behind the high school, and they brought her to their home, and that's where she died at. Hmm. It was there behind the school, but I, I remember what she looked like, and 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 I remember going there, and I can remember a time or two her coming to our home and spending some time, but I don't remember as much about her as I do on the other side because I live very close to my grandmother on the other side. Okay. Well, maybe you can talk about your... Well, on, on Mother's side, my grandfather there died uh, in November. No, he died in September before I was born in December of 1941. Okay. So I never saw either one of my grandmothers. Uh, my grandmother, there was... I'll have to think here a minute. There was... Four girls, mother had three sisters and two brothers. And my grandfather owned uh, a sizable amount of property, I'll say in the neighborhood of a thousand acres of property. Up what they called Deep Fire Road, or uh, Deep Fire Road back then, it's called, now they called it Ridge Road back then, now it's Deep Fire Road, because it's on the road that the steam plant's on. <coughs> uh, and then when he passed away, it was split up among all the kids and my grandmother. So my grandmother got a farm and then got a, a plot out of it and everybody else got it. So they all got somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 plus a few acres of property. And uh, so dad and mother, uh, my, one of my aunts and her husband built the home initially that dad and mother lived in. And then when they split all the property up, they, they got a farm up the road, so they moved off and built another home, and mother and dad got that home, okay. whatever how they got it. And, and of course, it changed a lot over the years, but, uh, and it's, it's still standing. But they, uh, then they lived there, and that was about, about one mile from the home place where my grandmother lived. And, of course, we grew up farming. Part of my memory, Dad farmed some, but he never liked farming. He just did not like farming. 
he went to work for a construction company up in uh, Virginia and had actually had spinal meningitis, but survived it. And uh, he, when he got out of the hospital, he came back home and they were beginning to build the Duke Power steam plant over near above where we lived. But they call it the Cliffside plant, but it's just as close to where we live as it is to Cliffside. Hmm. Uh, and it's a, it's a, the plant basically it sits right on the Cleveland County, Ruffin County line. Part of the plant pays county taxes to Ruffin County and other, and they pay part then to Cleveland County. Oh, wow. uh, and as a kid, they also had a mill hill up there. You called it a mill hill? Yeah, they, they called it a, a, they called theirs a village. Okay. Duke Park Village. It okay. wasn't a mill hill, it was a village. Uh, and I had uh, one aunt and uncle who lived there for a long time in the village. My uncle worked there and dad worked there. And, and dad had gone to work there while it was under construction and then hired on once it started up. Okay. Uh, and he worked there for, well, until he retired. Uh, I think he put in about 40 years with Duke. Thirty. It was either 39 or 40. And when he retired, he was a, he was a shift supervisor. Worked shifts the entire time he was there. Uh, you say he worked third shift? No, he worked shifts, rotated. Shifts. Okay. He rotated. And uh, so anyway, uh, my uncle then was a big farmer. One of my uncles was a big farmer, the one that lived there in an area. And he then rented our farm. Okay. But as far as mother was concerned, it might as well have been ours because we hit the field every day mm -hmm. just like we owned it. We worked for my uncle just like we owned it. He paid us, not much, but he paid us. Uh, but it, it didn't matter whether he paid us or not, we'd have been out there. So I grew up on the farm, gosh, I plowed mules and thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I got to get on a tractor instead of having to plow the mule. Uh, and plowed, and uh, I farmed uh, until I got out of high school. Uh, and I actually built a home across the road from my mother and dad. I fooled around and got married when I was in high school. Uh, my wife and I got married in 1959. And my senior year in high school, I worked a third shift and went to school full class all day. Uh, and so that's, that's how I got out, that's how my senior year in high school. And then dad and I, I was working at PPG, rotating, and Dad and I built the home that we lived in then, from mm -hmm. scratch. We, Dad laid the brick. We, Dad could he he done everything. He, he 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 was a he was a licensed electrician, licensed plumber, and plus he worked at Duke Power for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, but he done a lot of things on the side. He worked all the time. He just absolutely worked all the time. But we built built our home. It took us a little over a year to build it. But anyway, I was telling you when I was growing up on the farm, my grandmother most all the time fixed lunch for everybody. Okay, on, on the farm? On the farm. And she was a good cotton picker. Uh, I was never good at picking cotton. I hated picking cotton. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mind so much the hoeing. I didn't mind so much plowing the mules. But I hated picking cotton. I'd done everything I could do to get out of it. Hmm. I just didn't like it. Uh, but, but grandmother would, we'd go there and eat and then every Saturday night we gathered it, grandmother, my grandmother, just the whole crowd did, not just us, the entire family, everybody that lived over there. We, mother had one brother that lived below Gaffney, didn't, didn't see a whole lot of him. He still had a farm up there, but he, he, he leased it out to people and, and it had a home on it. He normally just leased it out to, uh, uh, uh to a family to come in and farm it, and he'd get part of the crop. Was that a crop. sharecropping? Sharecropping system. system. Okay. They they lived in they lived in the home, and then just sharecropped. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget the family that lived there for so many years. They they had twenty one children. It was a white family. They were huskies. Great family. Never they were never all at home 
at the same time that some of them obviously was grown and gone. But they would they would get up in the morning and go out and pick a bale of cotton every day. And and then back in the bed, of course, didn't there wasn't no TVs or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but my grandmother, I can see her now, she always wore a bonnet, had an apron tied around her, anywhere you saw her. She was a she was not, I wouldn't put her in a category that said she was fat, as we call it, but she was she was overweight. She was mm -hmm. overweight. And always just jolly as she could be. I mean, mm -hmm. just, she had a good time. Mm -hmm. She loved to have a good time. And uh, we had a good time with her. Yeah. Uh, go down there. My, my uncle lived in the home with her, lived in the house with her and his wife. And he had two kids, a boy and a girl. And the girl was just... A year younger than me, and uh, so uh, her name was Sandra. We grew up together, and we had we had a lot of good times. We used to. She didn't like picking cotton either. We used to do all we could do to get out of picking cotton, but we never were able to get out of the field. But we never did do much good picking cotton either. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so that's my grandmother died when she was eighty four. My grandmother. Humphreys died when she was 84. Mm -hmm. Grandmother Scruggs, I think, was just under 80 when she died. I'm not positive. I think she was. You say that side, I think your mother's side was Humphreys? Humphreys, oh. right. Right. And uh, there's not any of them left now. Mother was the last one to die. My mother was, she died uh, on December the 26th. And if she'd have lived until February the 10th, she'd have been 96. Uh, she was always a stout person. She used, when she was 94 year old, she could sit right down in the middle of that floor, cross her legs, and jump up just like that. Until she, she fell and broke her hip when she was 94. Mm. And after that, she was never strong again. Mm -hmm. But up until then. She was good. And always had a incredible, May Eider, who you interviewed, still has a super good memory and a good mind. Mm -hmm. My mother was the same way. Okay. She's, she had a great mind. Hmm. And dad died when he was 84 also. Wow. And so did you, did you interact with the, 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 the Huskies much? Yeah, because I grew up with the boys there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we gosh, I sat at that table. They had, they lived in this fairly big house, but the kitchen itself must have been twenty five foot long, and they had a, just a great big table that run right down the middle of it. I guess they had to. They had to, <laughs> and I've eaten there many a times. Yeah, lots of times. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I went to school with with the boys and and the girls too, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you describe maybe, did, did you spend much time observing the mill town or did you get a sense for any of what it was like, how it worked, what the type of community it was? Oh, well, I know a little bit about the kind of communities it was. It was very similar to the Duke Village. But, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, I had uh, later on, actually after I was, Married, I, I knew quite a few people that lived in the Dover mm -hmm. uh, Mill Village, and so I've been in their homes and spent time with them and talked about it. And they, you know, they rented those homes for something like five dollars a week, okay. and and lived there because uh, they could basically they could walk to work because it's all right around the plant. Uh, I never worked in a quote cotton mill. I've been in them, but I never worked in one. I worked, like I said, before I went to work for PPG, I worked at a place called Cherokee Finishing. Okay. What they were was a dyeing and printing facility. They brought fabric in mm -hmm. that was produced somewhere else and either dyed it or printed it, and they dyed some yarn also. But uh, Maybe you can tell me about the Duke Village, then, if you knew more, a little more. Well, it was very similar to, similar to the Mill Hills. It was... And, and the only reason I said I knew a little bit about it is was when I was growing up, when Dad would go to work on, when in summertime, if I didn't have to be in the field for any reason, I would 
I'd go up to my aunt's and stay, and because I had some friends that lived beside her, two two guys, and uh, so I'd go up there, and uh, we we played in the village, and and in fact, uh, before Asha and everybody else got so involved with safety and everything, we used to play in the plant. It, it was wide open; you could go in there anytime you wanted to. Mm -hmm. We played all over the steam plant. I never forget, you know this had these graded floors and we could go all the way up on top and look all the way down and see the bottom. Nobody ever bothered. We didn't bother nothing. Mm -hmm. We were smart enough to know we didn't fool with anything. Mm -hmm. But we played all over that village and in that mill and coal yard and uh, the river, of course. Mm -hmm. The river was the big thing when I grew up. That's, that's the only place we had to go swimming, basically, was the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Is there any pollution from the... That you knew of, or? Well, now, as I look back, yeah, I can remember as I look back now, when Dad would come home from work, his car always had this uh, black tent on it of, uh, I, I think it was soda ash, they called it, but out of the coal. But, mm -hmm. uh, it was little, it'd just be little black speckles everywhere, so, mm -hmm. you know, whether any of it got in the lungs or not, I don't know. And did you know anything about recreation in the mill town, where there like bars or anything like that, or did you have to go out? Were there wasn't no bars. Were there like house bars? That's what in some, not in, in, in similar types of communities that I've seen in other places. There's like people would have little houses where they give out, you know, besides the big sell beer or something like that. Mm -mm. No. Well, wasn't nothing like that. Wasn't legal here. Anybody was doing that was hiding. Oh yeah, that's. Oh, there's plenty of bootleggers. Yeah. Okay. There were plenty of bootleggers, but it was nothing. It, it was not legal at all in Cleveland County. And uh, so, no, it wasn't anything like that. Now, the Dover Mill had a, uh, they had a grocery store in their, their mill, mm -hmm. which was not, as I understand it, was not owned by the Dovers. It was owned by a private individual, and it was called the Ore Supermarket because the Dover Mill was here and the Ore Mill was just right down the street, and it was called the Ore Supermarket. and. Uh, and, and it was run by a private individual and ran until maybe 12 or 15 years ago. They just kept it open. And in fact, the, uh, the people who, who ran it uh, are still in business, but they got out of the, gr for the most part, the grocery part, and they're just primarily a meat market now, but not the same place. It's in a different place. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, everybody had played played sports. Uh, okay. When when I grew up, even in our township, we had a. It, this, when I grew up, the county had it's either thirteen or fourteen high schools within Cleveland County. Oh wow! It's all small schools. Yeah. And they all and they had elementary schools. In most cases, they had elementary school and high school together. But in my case, because we were on over near the state line, we had an elementary school that went through seven grades in the community. And so that's where I went to elementary school. And, uh, and you know, when, there'd be two grades in the same room many times. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can imagine what the education was like, but, mm -hmm. but we went to school. Uh, generally walked to school. In summer, when it was warm, I walked barefooted. I never wore shoes or it was warm enough to go without shoes. Uh, and but we had a we had a really nice baseball field. Yeah. Didn't have a lot of seating capacity, didn't have really any seats at that time. But people would just come and sit on the ground and all. But but I remember when I grew up, baseball was the thing. There was no such thing as football. Uh, very little basketball, except in the high schools there was basketball. But even when I grew up our our high schools didn't know what football they didn't have football. Just, just basketball and baseball. Hmm. Uh, but baseball was huge. Uh, there used to be uh, uh, I, I won't say there, they, there were not pro teams, but they were there were teams that traveled and, and they always had one there in our community that traveled. and it was made up of the men that worked primarily. There'd be a few young guys on it, but mostly it was, it was guys. It was anywhere from, from twenty one to 
35 year old and, and, and they didn't get paid for it, but they loved baseball and they played baseball. Mm-hmm. And gosh, we used to spend a lot of time up there if, uh, if we wasn't in the field, like I said, and especially on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoons and they'd play baseball. Mm-hmm. And uh, then... Did you play? Yeah, I played some baseball. I was never as good as some people, but I played high school ball. Okay. Up until I got married and I didn't play at the vet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, the, uh, they also had a lot of little league teams and a lot of uh, pony league, they called it, which was uh, 11, 12, 13 year olds. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 12 year old ended little league. It was 13, 14, and 15 year olds, I believe it was, it was Pony League. And I had an uncle, my uncle that lived in that area, he was a huge baseball fan. Gosh, he used to carry us all over the country on Saturday nights to watch baseball. Hmm. But, but he also coached that Pony League team for about five or six years. And they had one of the best in the state over there. It was, it was really, had, because they had, a, they had a couple of pitchers come along that was just, was just really good hmm. out of the community. So yeah, baseball was was played everywhere, and even after baseball, it started petering out in the local communities. The churches all had softball teams, yeah. So they played softball. Yeah. They started out as all fast pitch, and I can remember playing fast pitch after I was married. Uh, we played in a league uh, that was actually in a league from Gagney, South Carolina. We we used the school for our home field, and we played fast pitch, and then. I'm going to say in the late 60s, it started going up to all slow pitch softball. Mm-hmm. And fast pitch went away. Mm-hmm. Fast pitch is kind of on the comeback now. Mm-hmm. It almost went away for a long time. Yeah, you see in a top particularly because it's got to be so big in the, in the colleges. Yeah. Well, that yeah. blew up, it seems, especially women's. Yeah, softball. right. Yeah. And so now it's, it seems, well, there's not much, you don't see a lot of men's yeah, yeah, fast right. pitch. Yeah. It's mostly women in the fast pitch. Uh, so anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that you remind me, and I wanted to just spend a little, maybe just a little bit longer back, back a little bit. Uh, what was the role that was? Were you, was your family on outside side churchgoers? Um, I'm sorry, say churchgoers were they religious? And yeah, my mother's particularly. Uh, she, I grew up as a Baptist, okay. and. Uh, there was a Baptist church in the community, and yeah, every Sunday we were at church, Sunday and Sunday night. Uh, my dad rotated, and he was never much of a church goer. Mm-hmm. He was only off generally one Sunday night a month, oh. maybe two. He was two when he was on the first year up and off. And so, and, but one Sunday morning service is basically the only time he is off mm-hmm. a month. And so he just never, he never was much. Mm-hmm. Into going to church, he'd go once in a while, but he wasn't he wasn't big religious like mother was. Mother, yes, we went to church every Sunday. And what do you think it meant to her to have that church as a routine or to have it something? Oh, I think uh, because the way she was raised with uh, my grandfather and my grandmother, uh, I, I don't know that she, I don't think she would have known what to do. She hadn't had that to go to church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, she just uh, don't take that. No, I'm gonna cut it off. Pause it real quick. Then. I'm gonna cut it off. Okay. Uh, but she just uh, she she thought that that was just what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's just what she believed. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, she was supposed to be there. Did you ever rebel from? church? No, I did. Okay. No, I've always gone to church. Still do. Okay. Still do. That's uh, I guess something that she has still done. So mm-hmm. I actually go to a Methodist church now. But. Okay. Okay. And what, um, what was there, was there any sort of class differences between Methodist, Baptist, or the, especially Wasn't the Pentecostal? Wasn't nothing but Baptist. Where you were? Well, yeah, well, you couldn't hardly find anything but Baptist anywhere around here mm-hmm. in okay. Cleveland County. Yeah. You could find a, a few Methodists, but 
until uh, I was grown, I never knew there was anything but a Baptist church. Like the Pentecostals hadn't come yet? Uh-uh. Well, no, there wasn't anything like that. Uh, everything in our community was Baptist. Yeah. And, and even the surrounding community, everywhere was all Baptist. Shelby and Yakney had some Methodist churches. They wasn't, they could have been one or two out in the, out in the countryside, but I never knew of them. Mm -hmm. It was all Baptist. And, and I'd never, I, I never even dreamed of being a Catholic church around here until oh, I was grown. Yeah. It was not, yeah. They built the first Catholic church here in Shelby. And the only one, maybe still the only one in Cleveland County. I'm not sure there's more than one in Cleveland County. It's mm -hmm. a fairly large church. But, uh, but no, it wasn't, it, it was Baptist or you, you didn't go. <laughs> and it was the old time Baptist preachers too. Believed in fire and brimstone. Okay. They got up and told you how bad you was every Sunday. Okay, were there revivals that you attended? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two a year. Two a year. Were yeah, a spring tent? revival and a fall revival. These were, in, were these tent revivals? No, no, they were in the church. Okay. Yeah. There were some tent revivals around, but I never went to one. I okay. always went to the, it was a, we had a spring, and, and they always had a visiting pastor. And, and I can remember Mother Newman generally feed him one week, one night out of the week, because mm -hmm. he'd go around to different places and eat, you know. Um, and was there was there much? Did you were you aware of much clan activity when you were growing up? As as far as in Cleveland County, more under. Uh, after I got up, after I got up in high school, I knew there's some clan activity around, but I was never I never saw it, never was involved or, or, mm -hmm. or got close to it anymore. I'm sure I probably was around some people that were clan members, but I never knew it. Mm -hmm. It was a fairly secret organization. Mm -hmm. You had to almost be in it to know anything about it. Yeah. Uh, other than, unless you was one of the people being attacked, possibly, you know. Which, unfortunately, there was a lot of that went on, I guess. I, I never actually saw it. I never saw that take place. Did you hear about some of the cross burnings? Or yeah, I heard about it after I was. But, you know, we, we heard about it more after we got uh, televisions. Yeah. And we hear, we hear a lot about it down in Alabama and... Georgia and the lower part of South Carolina, and it was going on around here, but we just didn't hear much about it. Mm -hmm. Later, I found out it was going on quite a bit in this area. Mm -hmm. I think North Carolina had the highest. Mm -hmm. some, when it when it reemerged later in the sixties yeah. and seventies, it was big here. But yeah, uh, yeah, it, uh, they were, it it turned into a, well, it turned into just a mess and a nightmare, really, which mm -hmm. is which is pretty sad. And were you, you were, uh, desegregation didn't happen while, while, while you were in high school, it was a little bad. No, idea. no. I told you I graduated from Bowling Springs and I was in the last graduating class before yeah. they uh, uh, brought all the schools together. Mm -hmm. and, and even then, they kept, they didn't have the new schools built and so the, uh, what they done, they took that 13 or 14 high schools and made about four high schools because that's all they could accommodate. Mm -hmm. And they moved the elementary schools out into the other schools for elementary. And they started, just after that, they started uh, desegregation okay. and bringing, bringing black kids in. And then it went to full segregation when they opened the new high schools, which was... Full integration? I mean full integration. Yeah. When... Uh, uh, they built two, we only got two county, well now there's four schools in the county system, but initially there was two, and uh, the city of Shelby still had a school, Kings Mountain still had a school, so there was four total schools even then, but the two, only two county schools. Uh, you can pause it, it's fine. But anyway, that's when full integration took place, is when they opened the two new county schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I never went to school with any with any black kids, but it wouldn't have bothered me because growing up on the farm, I, I didn't I didn't know the difference because we worked together all the time. Yeah. Because my uncle, we worked for my uncle, like I said, but he had black tenants all over the place. Okay. And uh, and shoot, we worked together. Uh, I've said it, and, and uh, 
at, at black tables when I was little many times and eat lunch or mm -hmm. eat, eat at night and that kind of thing. So, uh, mm -hmm. There was a black family that lived right in my uncle and grandmother's yard there. I mean, just, gosh, we, when Sandra and I were growing up, we stayed in their house all the time because they had a bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. No, we never knew the difference. We uh, 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 we we knew this. We knew we knew that other people thought there's a big difference, but we didn't know why necessarily. When I was growing up. What do you mean, other people? Well, I mean, the, but we knew that they had we knew they had black schools. We knew there's black churches. Uh, we knew that the fire. They had a separate week for the blacks for the fire, mm -hmm. for the county fire. They'd have the white fire this week, and next week it'd be the black fire. We knew all that, but like I said, we, we grew up with them. We just mm -hmm. thought, we didn't know why they done that way, but we just knew they did. Mm -hmm. uh, our mothers, in fact, parents was always saying, yeah, you, you got to just be careful. You're not going to marry one of those black people. Now. You know, that kind of, we, we already did hear that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and never, after I, after I got into high school then, of course, I didn't, I didn't have as, quite as much interaction with them other than working on the farm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, seeing them out at, in the fields. And then as, as I got, like I said, as I got into high school, and then my uncle started to use me in different ways on the farm with the tractors and things, so I wasn't as close to them out in the fields as I had been. But, mm -hmm. but we, we, didn't, we didn't know the difference, gosh. I, I had some really good friends that were black people, really good friends mm -hmm. that I grew up with. What do you think the impact of, just my last question about this era, I know we go, because this is 21st century, so I'm going to take us up. Um, the effect of boll weevil, I guess you were around, was it early 50s? When uh, I think it was actually maybe 1949. Okay. 48 or 49. So you're still... I was still on the farm. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah I, I, it, was, it was awful. Gosh, it was... It just ruined the farmers. It put them out of business. Uh, When when, the, when we first found out about about boll weevils, and I became conscious of them, we were having to spray insecticides for them, trying to kill them. And I had I had one uncle that married one of my mother's sisters that he farmed. They farmed that the farm that she had got, and and he always farmed up until just before he died. He farmed it with mules. He didn't want no tractors on his land. He said tractors would pack it down. He didn't want that on his land. So he farmed with mules. And I can remember he used to go out and uh, pick up the squires off the ground. When the bow weevils would hit them, they'd just fall off the ground. And, and the, the squires was going to make, we call them squires, but that was the preceding of the bowl for the cotton. You get blooms and then you get squires, and then out of that squire comes a bowl. And they would, he'd, he'd go out and pick them up because he, in his mind, if he'd go out there and pick them up, they couldn't spray it. He'd kill them, so he'd take them and throw them in a, into his stove at home in the fire and, and burn it, burn those things up. And then we sprayed, gosh, and then this is, we didn't, had no clue about wearing masks and that kind of stuff back then. I can remember riding a mule sprayer, and you just, and if it was, we didn't spray if it was wind was blowing, if it was good and calm. And you turn right back around and you just go right back. It just be settled there, all over, and go right back into it. Mm -hmm. You could smell it. You knew it wasn't right, but you didn't know any better. You just. Mm -hmm. And then we. And he always done. He always sprayed. I sprayed for him a lot of times at night with his mule spray, and we always sprayed at night with the tractors too. You just go a lot faster with the tractor spray, and you could kind of run off and leave it. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, but the bow weevils just, it, it just put small farmers out of business. They just would kill them. I mean, you, you, had, you, had, you had families that were making a living off of 25 or 30 acres of cotton. Mm -hmm. And when, when the bow weevil came and their crops went from, a, back then a good, good crop would be a bale of cotton to the acre. And when they went from that to half a bale, a quarter of a bale, they couldn't pay the fertilizer bills. Mm. So the small farmer, they borrowed money and bought their fertilizer and then paid off in the fall when they harvested their crop. Well, 
They've raised a little grain, but normally they raised it just to feed their livestock for the most part. Hmm. Uh, and a little corn, but this wasn't good corn country either. But uh, they just they it just they finally just went out and cotton went away. Uh, I don't know if anybody's told you in any of the interviews or not, but one time Cleveland County and another county out east, which might have been Robinson County, I'm not sure, but they were always in competition with who raised the most cotton. And at one time, Cleveland County had over 80,000 acres of cotton and ginned about 83, 84,000 bales of cotton a year. And there was something like 35 or 36, 37 cotton gins. Today in Cleveland County, there's probably 3,500 to 4,500 acres of cotton. And there's two cotton gins in the county. Mm. Yeah, so it just, it, and, and it went lower than that. It, it's, it's actually been on a little bit of a comeback. But it's uh, it's guys like uh, Max Hamrick over in Boylan Springs that raises himself. He's got one of the cotton gins, but he raises over a thousand acres of cotton. Uh, he farms about, he rents most of the property, but he farms about between 2,000 and 2,500 acres. About 1,000 or so of that will be in cotton every year. He rotates it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the bow weevil was very detrimental to, to mm -hmm. Cleveland County, and not only Cleveland County, but um, it came up, it came out of the south and moved up out of the south. And it was, gosh, back in the 30s, I think, in the deep south that it was getting hit hard with bow weevil. Mm -hmm. And then they finally... Finally figured out how to get rid of it, and it's not a problem anymore. There is no bow weevil anymore. So people don't even put out the pesticides for it anymore, insecticides for it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, cotton, if cotton's really changed now, if, in a good year, if they don't raise two bales of cotton to the acre, they don't feel like they've done anything. So that's just how the... It's changed. That's how, well, that's how it's changed and progress. And yeah. How they've improved the cotton itself mm -hmm. over the years. Can you tell me... Um, about what just tell me about PPG and what it was like working there or some of your experiences there. Well, yeah, I, I could probably spend a month talking about PPG. <laughs> I went to work for PPG in 1961. I, like I said, I got married before I got out of school and I was working down at this place in Gaffney. And, uh, PPG had started up in 1959. They came in, they came in in 58 and built a plant. Started production in 59, and I remember our graduating class, it was a big deal. They had a big old house, and I remember going to, on a tour. They actually ran a train out of Shelby, all people out there to go through the plant. But PPG came in and started up in 59, and then late, sometime in 60, and I think it was late 60, a company by the name of Fiber Industries came to the county, also made polyester fabrics, polyester yarns. That went somewhere else to make the fabric. Fairly simple, I mean, fairly similar processes, but but different to to fiberglass. PPG. This plant was fiberglass. Nineteen sixty one. My brother and I. I was work still working at Cherokee Finishing, but I wasn't getting this curtailing. I was getting but about three days a week. And he is out of work. And he came by one Friday morning and said, come on, let's go to Fiverr and PPG and put in our application. I said, no, nah, I like what I'm doing. And he said, no, nah, come on. So we went to Fiverr first, and then PPG, we had to go to the unemployment office. That's where they were putting their applications in at. And we put in our application. The very next Friday, both of us were at PPG for interviews. And 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 uh, my brother, the high-paying job up there was winding glass. They used to call it pulling glass fiberglass was gravity fed but anyway it was winding glass and it was a tough job it was a tough job but it was the best paying job paid uh, top pay was up to about a dollar and a half an hour and my brother got interviewed first after we took all the tests and he come out just smiling said, I'm gonna wind glass a dollar and a half an hour and I went in and the guy sitting there I never forget his name per personnel guy's name was Lee Waters and he looked at me and he said you can't wind glass. I said, I can tell you right now, you wouldn't last a week. 
I thought, shoot, he's not going to give me a job. He said, but I got this job and I think you'll like. I said, it won't pay as much, but it's in quality control. I didn't have a clue what quality control. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so he carried me out and I talked to this guy that was the department head in quality control. And he said, all right. So I went to work for a dollar and a quarter an hour. And at that time, I, where I was working, I was, I'd worked myself up to the dye room person and I was making a dollar and 60 cents an hour. But like I said, I wasn't getting the three days a week. So... And they were talking about selling that place down there anyway. So I said, I talked to my wife about it. And I said, I'm going to take that job. So that's what I done. I started out making a dollar and a quarter an hour. And I worked shifts in, in quality control uh, as a, what they called a floor technician. I was actually, I wasn't in a lab. I was out on the floor. But lab was home base, but I didn't spend any time in the lab. 19, that was, that was in uh, fall of 1961, I went to work October the 1st. Roger Maris was in the big deal trying to hit uh, over 60 home runs. Mm -hmm. And oh, I never will forget, I went up there for an interview. They had that plastered all up and down the halls. His progress and everything. Him and Mickey Mountain Buck. Anyway, I went to work and, and it was uh, late 62. They offered me a non-exempt salary job in quality control, which was still a shift technician, but it was in charge of the lab on that shift and, and the technician. And my salary was $320 a month plus overtime. And that don't sound like nothing today, but that was, that was I, I thought I was getting there. I never will forget, I told my wife right after that, I said, if I ever get to $400 a month, we'll, we'll have it made. Of course, the cost of living was going up quicker. But, mm -hmm. And it took me, I tell you what, I got $20 a month raises first three years I was on that non-exempt job. Mm -hmm. And 1965, my boss called me. I, actually, I was off the shelf. I was working in a day job, still as a non-exempt salary person and I was doing this was for the age of computers we done everything by hand and they I was doing spec sheets typing spec sheets and doing statistical evaluations taking a bunch of numbers and mm -hmm. plugging them into a calculator and, and that's what I was doing and I'd been doing that for about seven or eight months and my boss called me in one day and he said uh, I got this job I want to talk to you about he said I don't know much about it, so I can tell you it's not fiberglass, it's with chemicals. But you won't have to move, you can stay here. He said, I can't tell you anything else. I said, you're going to be traveling. I don't know where. He said, uh, but what I can tell you is, if you want the job, you get a $100 a month raise. And I said, I'll take it. Had no clue what I was going to be doing. But $100, I mean, I'm just going up 25%. Yeah. And, uh, and I did. And I've done that for eight and a half years, and it amounted to going out with high-strength chemicals and diluting them into customers' plants. I wasn't driving a truck or anything. I was driving my car and flying, and we had a, had a trucking company that hauled the chemicals. We owned the trailers but uh, because they had to be out special alloys. It was hydrogen peroxide. And it was real high stress, and it would, it would, it would, if you didn't handle it properly, it would start fires and that kind of thing. And so, I done that. Uh, I traveled heavily. I had ten states assigned to me, and I traveled heavily for five years. And it was just getting to me. I mean, I was gone. I was averaging four nights a week away from home, and never in the same spot but one night. And I walked in one day and told my boss, I said. The boss there, I was, and my real boss was in Pittsburgh, but I reported to a guy there in Shelby. It was kind of a pass through, and I told him, I said, his name was Gene Patterson. I said, Gene, something's got to change. I said, uh, either I'm going to get a helper or I'm going to have to quit. Or, and, 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 and our competition was all using what they called a dedicated driver that was trained to do what I was doing. I was going out and meeting the trucks and doing that, and they had trained drivers doing it. 
And he said, what do we need to do? And I said, well, we just need to get somebody down here. And so there's three guys came from Pittsburgh, my boss and two other people. And I told them, and they said, well, we don't want you to quit. I said, we've been thinking about this. I said, we'll go back and we'll give you a decision within a week. We'll either hire you a person. And the other thing was I told them I had to have a car. So I'm wearing my car out and they wouldn't, they just paying me mileage, but it wasn't, wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or, or they said, we'll either, we'll either hire a person and get you transportation or we'll go to the dedicated driver system. And we went to the dedicated driver system, which was the best deal we've done. So I worked another three and a half years as, uh, as still in technical services. I wasn't going out unless the, this trained driver we had, unless he was out for some reason, uh, uh, just going out and inspecting new equipment, inspecting tanks. And, going inside tanks and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd done that for another three and a half year. And and I was, in the meantime, when I started doing that, I wasn't gone all the time. And I was head of office and still in quality control. And the superintendent of quality control asked me if I, and when I wasn't real busy, would I consider helping them get set up and get started with computers? And this was all process type computers. And he really wouldn't want me to fool with the computer at all. We still was all data entry. You mm-hmm. plugged cards, okay? All he wanted me to do was to, to uh, determine what kind of what what knowledge would we like to have. We'd like to be monitored with a computer, and so that's what I started doing. And I came up with a whole bunch of programs. Anyway, uh, got back very familiar with a lot of people in the plant and a lot of management people. And in 1973, then they offered me a engineer's job. I never had, still had never been to college. Uh-huh. 1973, and I took it. 1975, after the the recession that we'd gone through there, 1975, they offered me a job in manufacturing as an assistant department head. But the vice president said the only way I'd get that job and keep it was if I showed some effort towards going to college. Now, he told me that in uh, at the end of August, I went to work in that job September the 1st and enrolled in college that next week at uh, night school at Gardner-Webb. But Gardner-Webb then didn't have a night program. So I, I wound up, had about nine hours of political science, that's all is given at night. And then I decided I'd go one semester, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna go to day classes. That's probably the hardest semester I've ever had because I took nine hours of classes and, and, and still tried to run my job and I just running back and forth from work to school. I said, this, is, this ain't gonna work. And I found out about the program down at Limestone. They had a really good night business program. So I transferred and went down there and graduated in 1981. And Do you and, think that was helpful to your skills as a manager or a business person? Well, I think it, it taught me some things, but it didn't teach me near what uh, real life taught me. Yeah. But what it did do for me was there was just so many jobs that you weren't going to get a shot at if you didn't have that degree. And I was very lucky to get the one I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, actually, the two, the engineer's job, it really required a college education also. And, uh, but, but, but back in those days, if you had, if you had been with a company and proven yourself, they would they were more willing to take a chance uh, than it would be today. Today, if you don't have that degree, you don't even get your foot in the door. You just mm-hmm. don't do it. Uh, and we had we had we had two or three other guys that that done fairly well that went to school after they got jobs or mm-hmm. went to school after they was at work. And and if, and of course today with PPG, you couldn't get those jobs with a business degree either. It had to be an engineering degree. But uh, anyway, I uh, it, yes, it was it, it was it was very worthwhile. It was a tough it was a tough uh, five and a half years, uh, six years, because I went to school at night. My my schedule was I went three nights a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, from six o'clock to ten o'clock. My schedule was uh, get up at four thirty, study, go to work at uh, six thirty get off at five, get in my little Volkswagen, 
and drive to Gaffney, South Carolina. And about halfway down, I crossed the road where I turned to go back up to my house. My wife met me there. There's a little country store with, with my dinner. And I ate in my Volkswagen while she sat there. And then I lickety split to Gaffney and got there by six o'clock and went to class. And I come back in, went straight to bed, got up at 4.30 and, and, and studied wow. and went to work. That's, that's the way I got through school. I, 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 the only thing I did, I took summers off. I wouldn't go to summer school. Okay. Uh, I had to have a break somewhere, so I took summers off. Anyway, when I graduated from college, within two months, they offered me a department head's job. And I got that job, and then about 10 months after that, they offered me a big department. And I'd done that then for a number of years. And then I went over to the hot end and the foreman side, which I didn't have much experience over there. And I was department head over there for not quite a year, and they offered me the production superintendent, which was assistant plant manager, basically. And, uh, but I had responsibility for the entire plant from a manufacturing side. And that was, let's see, that would, that would have been 1990, the end of 93. And I'd done that until the end of 94, and they were building a new, going to build a new facility down in Chester, South Carolina. And they had asked me if I'd go down there and go through the construction process, be the on-site person for the construction, and then stay on and run that plant as plant manager. Small plant, not a big plant. Uh, and I said, yes, I'd love to. And so that was my first plant manager job. Hmm. And then in 1998, uh, I was down there a little over three years, I guess, and and they were having some problems up here with different things, and they asked me if I'd come back up on just a uh, temporary basis, stay on down there, come up here and do some work on a temporary basis, and that turned into being a plant manager after a few months. So. When you say they, are you talking about, about the, management? Talking about upper management. Okay. You Pittsburgh. Know, are they still in Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, still are. Yeah, okay. in Pittsburgh. My boss then was in. After I was plant manager, my boss was in Pittsburgh. Okay. And uh, so I came back up here in 98, not real happy about it because I had a little plant down there. It didn't have any problems. This plant was huge and had lots and lots of problems. Uh, had a union knocking on the door. Uh, they were scared they was going to lose it. And I. I spent the first, uh, well, that temporary period, and then the first two months after I was announced as plant manager, just trying to meet with people and figure out, and we, we did win the election. And then... Uh, Which union was it? Uh, well, the last one was the Teamsters. We, before that, we'd always been bothered by Glass Blowers Union. We'd had several elections prior to that in the past. But uh, that one was the Teamsters. Uh, and then, I don't know, in 2001, I was offered a job to go run Europe from a manufacturing standpoint. And I really wanted to go. I wanted it bad because it was going to be a good opportunity. And what my, my thoughts was, I'll go take that and then I'll be ready to retire. And I've saved this money because you get a lot of, back then you got a lot of fringes by going over there and the way they paid you and stuff. But my mother at that time was 94. Hmm. And I was, my brother had passed away and I was the only one living. And I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do it. I've got, to, I've got to take care of my mother. She was still at home at that time. Well, my boss said, well, why don't you go home and think about it? He said, just tell me what will you do over there? And and we had two facilities over there, but they had one in the Netherlands that was in a lot of trouble. They was having a lot of problems. So I went home and didn't sleep at all that night. Talked to my wife. I come back in. He walked in my office at nine o'clock the next morning and said, "Okay, what'd you decide?" And I said, "Well, I won't move. I tell you what I'll do. I said I'll I'll take responsibility for the plant in the Netherlands." And just promise you I'll spend at least 50% of my time over there. Now, I was thinking for six months, what I thought he was talking about, on the temporary basis. 
he, he told me if it was falling over there to Europe, it would be a minimum of two years. They'd like for you to stay five because they invested a lot and get you over there. So I took the, and I took in addition to the Shelby facility, which had 1,876 people at that time. I took on the Netherlands, which had about 850 to 75 people. But of course, the big problem over there was it was all run, it wasn't owned by the government, but it was government unions, basically. Mm -hmm. and it was it was really a tough facility. So anyway, I wound up with that thing for two years almost. I made I made in eighteen months I made fourteen trips over there. So I got a lot of frequent flyer points. And then we we named somebody else over there to run that plant, and I came back home and and in two thousand and four, then I I was just burned out. I was ready to retire. I just mm -hmm. I told him, I had a different boss then, but I told my boss, I said, I'm retired, and I sent him a note. He said, okay. And they come down and talked to me about it and asked me who I thought ought to be the replacement, and I gave them my idea, and they did take that person. He was over in Lexington at that time. And uh, Then he came back down and said, when you get Tim trained, would you consider staying on at least one year and help us... Uh, rearrange and reorganize the plants into a different way, like we had the Chester plants there. That's it. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I said, at least I won't be getting all them stupid telephone calls at night. And so I did, and started on that, and I think it was December of 04. I mean, uh, December of 03. In January of 04, my boss come down one day and he said, hey, I'm going to China and Taiwan, how about going with me? So we're just gonna make a little circle over there. And I said, all right. So I'd never been to mm -hmm. China or anywhere I wanted to go. So we took eight days. We we done uh, 14 landings and takeoffs in wow. eight days. We visited every place you could think of in China. We, and I didn't know it at the time, but we was looking to try to find a place to produce over there, trying to find somebody to go in cahoots with, a joint venture with. And we had some facilities in Taiwan already, and so we visited them, and then we went to a bunch of different places in China. When we got back home, he, they had already talked to another guy that had helped negotiate some other facilities, and they asked me would I help him, help him negotiate the facility in China. We'd land, we decided on one that wanted to talk to us. So that last year that I was gonna stay at home and work on them other facilities, I made five trips to China. My last year I worked. And so I retired then, and at, at the end of February in 05, I retired. And in May, they called me and asked me if I'd consider doing a project for them in Tennessee. It's building a new facility for a customer, actually. And I said, yeah, that'd be right. So I went back and worked another year. But they called you uh, this year yet? No. <laughs> Well, they haven't called anybody much. Things have been down so bad. But, yeah. but I, I did I did turn down, and it wasn't an official offer, but it was sort of an offer to go back and do some work in China for a couple of years ago. And I said, no, I've had enough China. I won't go back. Mm -hmm. And I've since had an off offer from two competitors to do some work out of the country. And I turned them down. I didn't just didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much my history at PPG. That's great. It's a great company. They were very good with the people. They treated people well. And the difference, when I went to work for PPG, you know, I was looking for a place to retire. That's, right. that's what everybody was mm -hmm. back then, went to work. And you, you didn't, unless there's something, but you just didn't like it or, or you got in some kind of trouble or something. And, and the company treated you like they wanted you to retire there. It's not the case anymore. Uh, people go to work now and they don't feel like they've done anything if they don't change careers three or four times or five or six times. And uh, and generally they improve their stuff every time they do. So I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's the difference in what it was mm -hmm. when I went to work. What was the difference between, can you compare the, the uh, plant, briefly, 
in the Netherlands and Shelby as far as the influence of the unions there versus? Oh yeah, they was they pretty much had guaranteed lifetime jobs. Mm-hmm. You couldn't you couldn't terminate anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a we had a uh, an individual beat up our plant doctor, and we t- terminated him, sent him home. Anybody you terminated, you had to go to court to make it official. They made us take him back. We had a supervisor that we caught stealing while I was over there, red-handed, throwing the stuff over the fence. And we terminated him, and they made us take him back. They, they didn't make us put him back as a supervisor, but they made him take him back. You just, and, and if you did terminate somebody, if you were successfully terminated, you had to pay them for the next two years so they could supposedly find something else. And the reason for all that was, if they, if they didn't have a job and income, they would, the government kept them up. Yeah. So the government, is very difficult to get them to agree to terminate somebody. So why was the it, was there incentives for the company to be there? Was it a productive plant or? Well, yes, it was a fairly productive plant, and when the business and economy was good, we made a lot of money there. We didn't make money when the economy was bad because we couldn't lay people off, and when we had shut furnaces down, we had a lot of people not doing anything. Now, the government did finally start seeing that they was gonna have to do something or nobody was gonna be there. So they eventually allowed us to start hiring temporary employees. And you could keep them temporary for two years. If after two years, you hadn't done something with them, either laid them off, terminated them, then you had to make them permanent employees at the end of two years. So that helped us get through those turns because when you, when you had a downturn, then you could send the temporary people home. Mm-hmm and then start over that new two-year period when they come back. Uh, so that, that was beginning to help. When I left over there, we had over about 250 temporary employees when I left over there. Uh, so that, that did help. Uh, the, but that was the big difference was, was uh, very smart people. God, they're smart. It was, it was I'm telling you, I, I learned a lot in Holland. It was... I saw some things that's done over there. I mean, if you ever get a chance to go to Holland, go. It's all below, about 70% of that country is below sea level. And they've just developed all kind of property out of the ocean. And you, you, you can run four lane highways right through the middle of the ocean, 27 miles across water. And salt water on this side and fresh water on this side, or, or vice versa, because they're always pumping water out of the country. And they pump out of that side so long and get so much rain till eventually that side's not salty and it becomes fresh water. I mean, that's that's the truth. This side's fresh water, this side's salt water. Well, I can't imagine. Just on each side of the highway. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're smart people over there. Very smart people. I enjoyed my time. I, loved, I actually loved Hall. I, that was a great place. I don't live there permanently, but, yeah. but it was a great place to visit. Good food. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Hall. Two more questions because I know they've, they've been sticklers on how much time we yeah, can give them. I, usually I do much longer than an hour and a half interviews. Um, I mean, it depends on how long people have or what they want to do. But um, if you could uh, maybe say what, what's the best thing that's changed in the past 50 years in Shelby and what's the worst thing? What's, what's the worst thing that you've seen changed? Well, I think by far, to me, the worst thing I've seen is is the oncoming of drugs and, and uh, it's a big thing. When I was growing up, I didn't know what drugs were. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know aspirin was drugs. A Coke, Coke to me was a Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, I think that's, that's come on. Most people, particularly your age, would disagree with me today that I think we have quit disciplining our kids to the point that they don't generally, unless, and I'm not saying this 100%, but they don't really have respect for a lot of, a lot of people and their parents and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that's not 100%, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying everybody's that way. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of young parents that would solely, sorely disagree with me. They think if, that, that uh, a paddling is just, 
just it's just wrong. Right. right. I got my I finished it in high school. Uh, and I'm telling you right now, uh, I knew when I went to school if I and I had my my share of them, but I knew when I got a whipping at school, I was gonna get one when I got home. I mean, it was just gonna happen. And I never could understand why it got home so quick before I got there. <laughs> it did. And there wasn't no telephone. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it still got there. But, I mean, it was just a fact. And, and you, you know, you just, you really learn to respect and people. So, to me, that's, that's changes. The drugs, the, uh, I think uh, in industry, there's been, the, the economies and things have changed so much. Well, it's probably... What's changed everything is the fact that we became a worldwide market. That's what's really hurt the industries near. And, and they, they, they've sensed they're not as people oriented as they were one time. They're bottom line oriented now. It's, it's, it's bottom line, period. And that's a big change. So, but now, the things that's changed over the last 50 years that's good is there's opportunities now to get out and do things that they didn't used to be. Like I said, when I was growing up, until I, I never owned a car until I'd been married over a year. We drove my father-in-law's car, who was legitimately blind, and my wife's mother didn't drive. So my wife was the youngest child, and so she carried them everywhere they went. And like I said, when we was building our home, we lived with them for a year. And when we moved out, we bought that car because they, they couldn't drive it. Uh, first car I'd ever owned was 52 Chevrolet. Uh, and, but before that, uh, before I was married, anywhere I went, I walked or hitchhiked. Uh, I remember before I got, right before I got married, uh, dad had a pickup truck and a car. And my brother come home out of the service. He was eight years older than me. He'd come home out of the Air Force. And, and my brother and I, alternated every other weekend getting to use the car. And my brother had an old 49 Chevrolet he'd got when he was in the Air Force. And so the weekend he got Dad's car, I had to drive his old 49 Chevrolet. But he carried me somewhere. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have to ride a bicycle to go see my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. uh, but, to, you know, today there's just so many opportunities. To me, it's anybody who wants to su succeed today, if he don't, it's his own fault. Because he can. Hmm. I mean, you got it's just so, so much potential out there, and with the state schools, the state colleges, I, I'm not saying they're cheap, but compared to the private schools, that's a real deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I just think it's what's changed is that there's just so many opportunities uh, for people today. And you know, it's just maybe I see things wrong. I enjoy what I I enjoy volunteering with what we're doing here and I work with a lot of other nonprofits. Uh, DCC is turning into a full-time job now that we're getting close to uh, opening everything. But uh, once we get them open, I'm hoping that's going to slow down some. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to retirement more. My wife is going to leave me if I don't. <laughs> um, so in 20 years from now, what do you think is Best case scenario, worst case scenario for Shelby. But, you know, best case scenario, what will Shelby be like, and um, if something doesn't happen, like you think. It well, should. I think uh, I think best case scenario will be is that that our commissioners and I, and I'll say county versus just Shelby, but county, Cleveland County, will continue to draw in new industries. Uh, that we just announced one. Mm -hmm. And there's several more out there potential that they're looking at and working with. And so the best case scenario will be that we get an, uh, enough new industries in. Their unemployment will again go back down to the four and five percent range like it used to be, and uh, and people will all have good jobs and we'll have uh, we'll have a we, we will been successful in generating an area, building an area that people like to live in 
and their kids graduate from school, they'll come back here and work in those new industries and stay at home. Mm-hmm. They'll want to come back here. Today, that's not generally the case. Yeah. We don't have anything. We don't have theaters. We don't have anything for them to go to. Yeah, well, we've got a theater now, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of new industry. People will get their jobs back and, uh, and we will have a, we'll have an area that people want to live in. And they will go off and graduate from school and come back here and either work in the school systems or they'll work in some of these new industries that I'm hoping we're going to get. Mm-hmm. So I can kind of figure what worst case scenario would be, but... Worst, worst case scenario is that they fail mm-hmm. and that we fail as, as citizens to do what we should do to, to continue to improve the quality of life in Cleveland County and that our leaders are not successful in creating new jobs mm. through bringing in new industries. To me, that's a, and, and there's obviously those bad scenarios that somebody from over yonder decides to come over here and blow us up or something, but I'm not, yeah. I'm just saying those things are, hopefully those things are just out and talking about real life. Mm-hmm. I know that it, um, you kind of didn't go there when we were back in that time, but growing up, uh, if, if you had to say something about Earl Scruggs, as far as if, if, if you were talking to someone from China who's never heard about Earl Scruggs, if uh, you had to tell him to really know who Earl Scruggs is and what he's about, what would you, what would you tell him? Well, I can tell you, Earl Scruggs, because I do know a little bit about him, is, he's a, certainly a, a fine banjo picker. He's a fine musician. He's, he has been a big innovator over his career, an innovator in the fact that he didn't just stay bluegrass. He ventured out into other, other areas of music with the banjo. But, so he has been an innovator with the banjo. But I promise you that if Earl Scruggs walked in that door today and sat down and you talked to him, you'd swear he still lived in Flint Hill, North Carolina. He did not lose his upbringing. He is still, he is still very humble. Uh, he's very pleasant, very easy to talk to. Uh, and he still believes in that, uh, you do what your parents tell you to do, and, uh, and that you work hard. Yeah. And so he's, he's just, he really hadn't changed that much other than, I, I know he's been on television, he's done all kinds of things. He's traveled all over the world, uh, but he didn't lose his, he did not lose his upbringing. He really did not lose it. Hmm. So two, two more quick questions. Um, who was somebody outside of your family growing up that had the, sometimes it's a hit or miss question, but uh, someone outside of your family growing up that had the biggest impact on you? There's a lot of people. Uh, but growing up and in school, I had, I had three teachers uh, that, that, it had an impact on me, I think. One of them was Dan Moore, who only had through about my sophomore year in high school, and then he took a new job in Shelby. And another person was Ruby Surratt, who was uh, a teacher at Bowling Springs High School. But probably the by, by far the most influential teacher and person on my life was a guy by the name of Brooks Piercy who was a cultural teacher. He was, uh, he just, he just treated you in a way and that you wanted to go do things and do things differently and do more things. Mm-hmm. He, he just kind of inspired you to do that. Uh, he'd never tell you to go do something. He just, uh, he just encouraged you to always work hard and do the things and you, you just want to do different things in life or in life. He's just, he's just a heck of a guy. He just died uh, a little over a year ago now. He was in his 90s and still had a great mind and was still influencing people. People still went to him a lot for advice, and I'm one of them. That's pretty special. 
Um, then we asked this at the end, anyway, is, is there something I left out or I should have asked that you think people in the Earl Scruggs Museum would want to know or hear that I didn't really ask about? No, I don't, I don't know of anything. I mean, you, you've heard the story of how we got started for the Brownie and everybody. Uh, Do you want to tell that story real quick? Well, we got started initially by the fact that uh, I, I was still working and a guy by the name of Jim Allen called me here in town and said he'd had this idea, he thought we ought to do something for two people who had done well from our county, and that was Don Gibson and Earl Scruggs. Asked me would I help him, and I said, well, maybe, and so we met and talked about it, and I said, yeah, okay. And at the time, initial time, we was talking about having one venue with both names on it, okay, which would have been the museum. And that didn't work out, and uh, we couldn't get the two families completely together, and we just it just didn't work out. And uh, then, and Jim, for whatever reason, uh, got sort of uninterested in it and, and bowed out. And about that time, we had a small group working on it, and that group Brownie was a part of. Uh, and and at about the same time, uh, Brownie was talking with the county manager and said, you know, what can we do to kind of revive things and he suggested that we get this guy from North Carolina State to come up and and hold a, a session and we got about 40 people in the county and the county paid for that guy to come but we got about 40 residents just all over the county to, to agree to give up three days of their life and come in and spend three days with this guy wow. but one day at a time over actually three month period done one day a month and out of that uh, uh, we formed Destination Cleveland County and then we took uh, over a year as we were had high recommendations out from Ra people in Raleigh and other places that that we not even try to do anything until we'd done our research and made sure we knew what we was doing and getting into it so we took over a year and we had bus trips where we got filled up buses with citizens and we'd go somewhere like Newbury, South Carolina. We went to Bristol, Tennessee and different places and spent a day just seeing what the other people had done in theaters and museums and all kinds of things. And then uh, out of that, we decided we wanted to go forward with these two projects and we started a capital campaign to try to raise somewhere between nine and a half and ten million dollars and Little did we know that we announced our campaign and the bottom fell out of the economy. But we still stayed after it. And uh, we've raised right now just under $7 million. And uh, I still need about two more million. And we get lucky with a couple of grants and some other things we hope to make it. We're, our plan now, we opened a theater last year in 2009 and 2011, December 2011, uh, everything goes as planned. We'll open the Earl Scruggs Center. That's just a quick, quick synopsis how we get started. No, I think that's good for um, for people to hear. Yeah, it's uh, sounds easy, but it hasn't been no, easy. <laughs> Has not been easy. I promise. I don't imagine it was. Uh, it's it been was fairly time consuming. I hope so. I hope so. Well, thank you so much for your time. Well, you're quite welcome.